Welcome back to Invested, I'm Lockie, and today we'll get Apple stock, the world's most valuable company. Over the past one year, the stock is up over 32.79%, but over the past few weeks alone, the stock is actually down over 6.74% in value. So with a notable pullback in the price of Apple recently, the question naturally becomes, is the stock now undervalued, and is there a buying opportunity present? Well today, I'm going to be answering that for you. I'm going to be breaking down the business, focusing on all the key factors. It's financial strength, profitability, growth to management, then give you a current valuation and price target for the stock going forward, telling you if Apple is a buy, hold, or sell at this time. If you enjoy this type of content, then please drop us a like down below, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and let's get into it. So opening up our screener here, we're going to start off by assessing the financial strength of Apple. How financially strong is Apple as a company, and how likely is it that Apple can endure a financial downturn going forward? Well, if we come down here and have a look at the financial strength metrics, and of course when assessing the financial strength of any large company such as Apple, there's really one key metric we focus on, and that is the cash to debt ratio cash the business currently has on hand to meet their short-term and long-term debts outstanding. And the current cash debt ratio for Apple is 0.5, indicating that for every dollar of debt on their balance sheet, they have 50 cents in cash to meet that debt obligation. Not the most advantageous cash to debt ratio. It indicates that if Apple's management so desired, they could only pay down 50% of the debt outstanding on their balance sheet before needing to allocate additional operational cash flows towards their debt obligations to pay down those debt obligations going forward. It was an interest and principal based level. So not the best cash to debt ratio. And on the surface, this cash to debt ratio doesn't appear super favorable, but what some investors may be missing is the massive amounts of free cash flow being generated by Apple's core operations on a daily basis. Apple is one of the single most free cash flow generative companies in the world, generating massive amounts of free cash flow daily and monthly, giving them more than enough cash on hand to both pay down their debt obligations and continue to reinvest and expand their operations going forward. By virtue of these massive free cash flows flowing into the business, Apple has an immense degree of financial stability. This great degree of financial stability is reinforced by the high Altman score the company has been assigned. The company has been assigned an Altman score of 8.04, indicating a great degree of safety with the business and very little risk of financial default going forward. In the event of a financial pullback, Apple is exceptionally well positioned with a notable amount of cash on hand and consistent cash flows flowing in from operations, enabling them not only to endure a financial downturn, but also reinvest and re-stimulate growth through opportunistic acquisitions during a pullback. So on a financial strength basis, Apple is simply outstanding. But that's simply the financial strength of Apple. Now let's have a look at profitability. Let's see how profitable Apple is as a business. So if we come over here to profitability, and of course, when assessing the profitability of any large company, there's really four key things we focus on. Number one is the operating margins, number two, the net margins, number three, the returns on equity, and number four, the returns on assets. So if we come down here and start off with the margins, you can see operating margins of 29.78% and net margins of 25.88% absolutely outstanding. For a hardware orientated business, these margins are absolutely fantastic. Net margins of 25.88% indicate that for every dollar of revenue that comes into Apple's business, they retain about 26% of that as pure profit, which is absolutely fantastic and it's indicative not only of the hardware business of Apple, but also the services business and these higher margin businesses that Apple has been developing in recent years, yielding fantastic net margins for the business overall. On a net margins basis alone, Apple is fantastic within both the hardware sector and across businesses more broadly. But now let's take a look at returns on equity and returns on assets to see how the management is allocating their capital. So if we come down here to returns on equity, and of course when assessing a wonderful business, we typically look for returns on equity and returns on assets around 20%. So let's see what Apple is producing. Apple is producing returns on equity of 144.28%. Absolutely astonishing. These returns on equity are unworldly, absolutely fantastic, and very, very rare to see from a company of a large size, let alone a $2.77 trillion company. Absolutely astonishing returns on equity, indicating not only a great degree of quality in the underlying business of Apple, but also a great degree of management competency. Apple's management are clearly allocating capital well to make high returns on equity for shareholders, and that's symbolized by this immensely high returns on equity figure. Very, very impressive. Coming down to returns on assets, we've got returns on assets of 27.91%. Obviously not as high as our 144% figure, but still 27.91% returns on assets is absolutely astonishing. For a business of this scale, to be making returns on assets this high is absolutely fantastic. When we assess large companies, companies worth hundreds of billions of dollars, returns on assets of 10 to 15% is pretty impressive, but returns on assets in excess of 27% is absolutely astonishing. It indicates a large degree of underlying quality in Apple's business model, yielding them extraordinary returns on assets. So on a profitability basis, by virtue of almost every single metric we assess, Apple is absolutely fantastic. On a financial strength basis, they're well positioned by virtue of the massive amounts of free cash flow flowing into their business, and on a profitability basis, they're simply outstanding. But now let's get an idea of how much Apple is worth as a business, because although it may be a wonderful company, if it's not trading for a fair valuation, then buying into the stock right now could lead to losses in the short to medium term. 
So if we come down here and have a look at some basic valuation ranks. And of course, when assessing a business utilizing these basic valuation ranks, there's a lot of different ratios we can use to assess a business. We've got the PB ratio, PS ratio, PEG ratio, current ratio, quick ratio, all these different fancy, fancy ratios. But when it comes to assessing a business of this nature, utilizing these simple ratios, there's really only one I use. And that's the PE ratio, the price to earnings ratio. And the current price to earnings ratio for Apple is 30.21, indicating a large degree of growth assumption priced into the stock going forward. Investors in the broader market believe that Apple can continue to grow at an elevated rate going forward over the next 10 to 15 years. Growth rates on earnings per share basis and free cash flow basis in excess of 15% going forward over the next 10 to 15 years, and that's what this elevated PE symbolizes. Whether or not this PE indicates the company is over or undervalued is up for debate. What we are going to do later on is run a full DCF analysis, breaking down the company's earnings per share and free cash flow on a more granular level to give you a better idea of exactly how much the company is worth and exactly how much you should be paying per share for the company. So keep watching for that one. But before we get started on our DCF analysis, I want to break down some basic financial data associated with Apple. So if we come down here, we can see the revenue and net income for Apple between 2010 and 2021. You can see back in 2010, revenue was around 65,225 and net income around 14,000. And then in 2021, revenue of 365,000 and net income of 94,680. So you can see exponential growth over the past decade. Absolutely fantastic growth. Not only impressive growth, but also highly consistent growth over the past 10 years. And that's very, very impressive to see from a company that's already fairly mature. Also impressive net income growth over the past decade, symbolizing a great degree of increasing profitability for the company, and also a great degree of management competency with the management allocating capital well within the business to stimulate consistent revenue growth over the past 10 years. Very, very impressive. Coming over here to the cash to debt balance of the company over time, you can see over time, Apple has been accumulating more and more cash on hand. Back in 2010, cash on hand was only around 25,620. And then in 2021, cash on hand of 62,639 and debt of around 124,719. Starting back in 2013, Apple has begun to employ more and more debt on their balance sheet to the point where debt is now well in excess of their cash on hand. For some investors, they may feel as if this degree of leverage being employed by the company creates a degree of leverage risk for the business. That in the event of a financial pullback, the company may be exposed to default on these debts. That's absolutely not the case with Apple. Apple, as mentioned before has tremendous amounts of free cash flow being generated by their core operations on a daily basis, leaving them in a highly advantageous financial position. These massive amounts of free cash flow offset the debt related risk associated with this large debt load and thus leaves the company with a large degree of financial agility and in the event of a downturn, fairly well positioned not only to survive but also thrive coming out of that pullback. So on a financial strength basis, I have almost no concern with Apple at all. Coming down here to the returns on capital of the company over the past decade, you can see returns on capital have been fairly impressive over the past 10 years. Returns on capital of 34% back in 2010, and then returns on capital of 26% in 2021. So you can see, although we had a declining trend between 2010 and 2016, between 2017 and 2021, returns on capital have rebounded somewhat. Very, very impressive from a mature company. Over time, we would be expecting returns on capital to kind of taper off for the business. Given the maturing nature of the business, naturally lower returns on capital are made over time, and that's completely understandable. As Apple's business expands and grows, naturally it's very, very difficult to make those same extremely high returns on capital made back in 2010. If these low returns on capital were to perpetuate going forward over the next decade, I'd be absolutely fine with that. I have no issues with returns on capital around 15% going forward over the next 10 years. That would be absolutely fine for a company of this maturity. So that's some basic financial data associated with Apple, the PE ratio to give you an idea of what the business may be worth, and also some profitability and financial strength data to give you an idea of how the business is performing. But if we really want to understand what Apple is worth as a company and how much we should be paying per share for the business, then we'd have to run something called a DCF analysis, a discounted cash flow analysis. As Warren Buffett always says, the value of any business is the cash flow that it will return to its shareholders between now and Judgment Day. And that's exactly what a DCF tells us. We're going to run a DCF on both an earnings per share basis and a free cash flow basis to give us an idea of how much earnings the company is bringing in and how much of that is translating to free cash flow the company can actually use to expand and grow their operations going forward. So if we come down here, we're going to start off on an earnings per share basis. And if we come down here, we can see the earnings per share growth rates over the past 10, 5, and 1 year period. Over the past 10 years, it's been around 14.7%, 5 years, 18%. 0.8%, and over the past one year, a massive jump in growth tied to increased demand for Apple's products during the pandemic, a growth rate of 71% over the past one year. Massive growth over the past year. 
Do I believe this extremely high growth rate can perpetuate going forward over the next decade? Do I think they, they'll continue to compound at 71% annually? Absolutely not. This growth rate is far too high. It's indicative more of a one-time jump in demand for their products rather than consistent growth going forward. Going forward, given the ever-increasing demand for Apple's products and the heavily entrenched nature of their ecosystem, I believe Apple can continue to grow at a meaningful rate going forward over the next decade, and a more justified growth rate for the company going forward over the next 10 years will be more in line with their five-year growth rate of around 18.8%. We're going to be slightly more conservative on that number, and we're going to utilize a growth rate of 17% within our calculation going forward over the next decade on an earnings per share basis. So utilizing a growth rate of 17% going forward over the next 10 years, utilizing a discount rate of 8%, 8% of course is the long run return of the stock market, and that's a fair rate at which to discount our cash flows. Then our earnings per share figure of $5.62, taken down here for 12 month trailing basis, we come up to a fair value price target for Apple of $191.88 signifying about 11% short-term upside to the stock and that the stock is trading slightly below its intrinsic value at present. This discount to its intrinsic value creates a small opportunity for value-orientated investors, but a more advantageous opportunity for long-term orientated investors looking to pick up a wonderful company trading below its intrinsic value. But that's simply an earnings per share valuation of Apple. Now let's conduct a free cash flow valuation to give us an idea of how much those earnings are translating to free cash flow the company can actually use to expand and grow their operations going forward. So if we come down here, we're going to switch over to a free cash flow basis. And if we come down here, we can see the free cash flow growth rates over the past 10, 5, and 1 year period. Over the past 10 years, it's been around 13.9%, 5 years, 17.6%, and over the past 1 year, 31.7%. So you can see fairly consistent free cash flow growth over the past decade. Of course, another jump over the 1 year period tied to increasing demand for their products and services. Do I believe this 31% rate of growth can continue going forward? Once again, absolutely not. This growth rate is far too high on a free cash flow basis, and given the maturity of Apple as a business and the massive amounts of free cash flow already accretive on their balance sheet, I don't think we're going to see tremendous free cash flow growth going forward over the next decade. Free cash flow growth will likely largely be in line with their earnings per share growth rather than being in excess of their earnings per share growth going over the next decade given the existing maturity of their business operations. So taking that into account, we're going to utilize the same growth rate on a free cash flow basis as we did on our earnings per share basis. So coming over here, we're going to utilize a growth rate of 17% on a free cash flow basis going forward over the next 10 years. This takes into account the massive amounts of free cash flow already accretive on Apple's balance sheet and the unlikely prospects of free cash flow growth outstripping earnings per share growth going forward over the next decade. I think given the mature nature of the company, earnings per share growth and free cash flow growth will be pretty much in line going forward over the next 10 years. So utilizing that growth rate of 17% going forward over the next decade, once again with our discount rate of 8%, then our free cash flow per share figure of $5.45, taken down here for 12 month trailing basis, we come up to a slightly lower fair value price target of $187.68, signifying about 9% short term upside for Apple stock, and that once again the stock is trading slightly below its intrinsic value. So as you can see on both an earnings per share basis and a free cash flow basis, it appears as if Apple is trading slightly below its intrinsic value at present. This doesn't leave a major opportunity for value oriented investors, but it does create a fairly advantageous opportunity for long-term oriented investors looking to pick up a wonderful company trading below its intrinsic value and hold for the long term. But which of these valuations makes more sense for Apple? Which of these valuations gives us a better idea of exactly how much the company is worth? Well, given the maturity of Apple as a business and the massive amounts of free cash flow already accretive on their balance sheet and their steady inferred rate of growth going forward, I believe a free cash flow valuation would be a better way to value the company at this time. Investors in the market more broadly tend to value mature companies based upon their free cash flow rather than their earnings per share. Earnings per share growth is often used for rapidly growing companies, compounding the revenues at an exponential rate, and Apple is no longer doing that, just growing at a steady rate going forward over the next decade, and thus I believe a free cash flow valuation will be more suitable for the company at this time. So we're going to utilize a free cash flow price target as my current price target for the company, and my current price target for Apple is going to be $187.68 signifying about 10% short-term upside and a highly advantageous buying opportunity for long-term orientated investors. Given the entrenched nature of Apple's product portfolio, I believe the company will continue to perpetuate meaningful growth going forward over the next 10, 15 years, and even beyond. Apple has one of the widest economic moats in the world and will likely continue to exhibit meaningful growth going forward into the foreseeable future. These are products within an ecosystem that is firmly entrenched and unlikely to go away anytime soon. Apple is perhaps one of the single most wonderful businesses in the world, and given that it's trading slightly below its intrinsic value at present, for me right now, the stock is a buy. So that was my brief yet somewhat detailed analysis of Apple stock, a company with outstanding financial strength by virtue of the massive amounts of free cash flow being generated by their core operations on a daily basis, decent profitability, actually outstanding profitability, with fantastic operating margins, net margins, and returns on equity and returns on assets that are outstripping pretty much every other business we've analyzed. Returns on equity of 144% is absolutely world class. The company appears to be trading slightly below its intrinsic value, and given the quality of its economic moat and the long-term consistent growth prospects of the company, for me right now, the stock is a buy. 
If you enjoyed this video, if you've helped you learn something more about Apple as a company, then please drop us a like down below, hit subscribe if you haven't already. If there's a company you want me to talk about in the next video, then please just comment down below and I'll see if I can get onto it. But until then, thank you and I'll see you in the next one.